If uh, people could get in here and take seats, we could actually launch this Fandango on time, which would be fun and novel. <clears throat> uh, pardon me for sitting down making the introductions, but uh, we don't have a standing up mic. Uh, I'm Bob Spofford. I'm the Vice President of Sustainable San Rafael, standing in for Bill Carney, who's our president, who is off tonight doing something involved with his uh, book that he recently published. So it's all for a good cause. Um, my job is only to introduce the people, and then I'm going to shut up. Um, and the people really don't need much of an introduction at this point. I think almost everybody in Marin knows both of them. But just in case, on the left is Susan Adams, who is in her third term <laughs> as uh, County Supervisor from this district, District 1, and um, in those years on the Board of Supervisors, she's been on a whole alphabet soup list of state and county and regional boards and so forth and so on, some of which you'll probably hear about tonight, some of which you may not. In the real world, um, her career was pretty much in medicine and nursing. She has a PhD in nursing from UCSF. Uh, and most of her work focused, according to her bio, on um, public health type things involving things like uh, pregnant mothers and drugs and those kinds of public health problems. Um, so, and she certainly brought that perspective to her work here. Damon Connolly, sitting to the right, certainly knows how to work. <clears throat> certainly knows how to work all the buttons in this room. He has uh, spent every other Monday night for the past seven years sitting up at that table, going through listening to the business of the city of San Rafael as a member of the city council. Uh, prior to that, he was on the Dixie School Board. And in the real world, he is, was and is a lawyer. Um, he was for a while with the Attorney General's office up in Sacramento, specializing in a lot of energy stuff back in the days when Enron was trying to send us all to the poorhouse and things like that, and has put that work to work um, as the chairman of the Marin Energy Authority that has been very involved, Damon's been very involved with the launch of Marin Clean Energy from the very beginning. And that's the two people you already know anyway. Um, the third person on the left there is Jesse Madsen. Uh, he is associated. <laughs> Jesse is associated with all these bright young people you see sitting around you who are going to be asking all these really sharp questions tonight. Um, they are his students in the Marin School of Environmental Leadership, which is a program over at Terra Linda High School, which is now into its third year. Uh, it's what they call project-based learning, um, focusing on environmental issues and the development of the next generation of leaders. Uh, Jesse has been the lead teacher of this program as long as they've had a lead teacher, and next year they will graduate their first class of the future environmental leaders of Marin. And they're actually very interested in our politics here, so we all have to behave ourselves. And with that, for the program and the rules and how we're going to conduct the debate, I will turn it over to Jesse. Go. Thank you, Bob. So as a uh, history teacher, just a quick comment. Thank you for everyone for putting this on tonight, and thank you for inviting Marin Cell to be a part of it. And I just think it's a, a great opportunity to bring local government and politics to life for our young people. I think that uh, government is something that's read about in books and that most people in the community don't get the opportunity to uh, partake on a personal level. So I just appreciate the opportunity for our students to see this firsthand. <clears throat> okay. So... I will go over the rules of the debate and then we'll begin with some questions. So in the interest of time, please no applause during the question and answer period. Please save all applause for the end of the evening. Please write your questions on the cards that will be available throughout the evening. And these will be collected and sorted to preclude the repetition and ensure uh, subjects are relevant to the issues of sustainability. Please refrain from shouting out comments or questions. And uh, 
without further ado. Could you clarify what the question is? If you can keep them uh, contained to sustainability and sustainability issues, and they'll actually be collected and, and then brought up to, up to the mic here to be read. Thank you. So without further ado, we will begin with the questions. And the first question uh, will be directed towards Susan Adams for first response, and then Damon Connolly for a response. No opening. No opening. Comment. Oh, I'm sorry. There's a two-minute opening. You're right. <laughs> no, actually, I, I was told there wasn't one. Oh, okay. So, yeah, uh, I think we're launching right into the questions. Okay. That's oh, the, I think it changed. Did it change? Yeah, I, sorry. I, I have two memo. different <laughs> things. Um, okay. okay. So what you will have is a two-minute response to the question, and Susan will start first, and then Damon will follow. Okay. The first question, since both the Marin County and San Rafael general plans were enacted, how many public meetings have you called, attended, or participated in that specifically discussed and or called for public comment on transit-oriented development? What is your position on transit-oriented development? Well, over the course of the last several years, I've held numerous meetings on a variety of issues related to land use and housing. Um, besides the numerous planning commission meetings, board of supervisors meetings, the transportation authority meetings where we've talked about land use, housing, transportation, and how, how to allocate dollars, we went through a very rigorous housing element review and conversations about priority development areas. I created a public forum at the Civic Center that was moderated by Judge Adams where we had a panel discussion. Um, I held a large meeting at the Marinwood Community Center, which was quite lively last June. And I attended multiple small family house meetings um, with anywhere from 10 to 20 people in, in each meeting, representing a wide range of views and discussing the, the differences between Plan Bay Area, priority development areas, housing elements, and how a specific plan gets developed. There's a lot of confusion, and those issues are very complicated. But it was really helpful, I think, for me to hear from the community as well as from the community to hear um, what's, what's happening. Um, part of the reason why I moved into my condo in Marinwood was that I could take a bus from the 101 to work. And I think tra for me, transit-oriented development was something that worked well because I didn't have to get into my car to get into San Francisco. And if you drive up and down the 101 corridor, you'll see even in San Rafael, there's multiple three to five story multifamily buildings near the transit corridor. And it makes sense for those of us that wanted an opportunity to move um, along the corridor without having to get into our cars. Um, we're currently working on our new housing element. We're having a number of public meetings on that. And I think that the, um, the transit-oriented development is something that is going to be an important part of our tool chest in how we address climate change. Okay, thank you very much. All right, two minutes, Damon. Thank you, uh, Jesse. And first of all, thank you for everyone for attending this evening, particularly the students. It's great to see you. Uh, I've had a number of opportunities to work with the community on development, transportation, and housing issues. Most notably, uh, we had two community processes around our station area plans in San Rafael. Uh, we will have smart stations downtown here near the transit center, as well as the civic center. Our philosophy was to look at opportunities with those stations coming in to make improvements around the areas, including increased circulation so people could get around, bicycle and pedestrian access, uh, co connectivity to public transit, and of course, are there mixed use opportunities to spruce up the areas? I'll tell you, though, what I believe and what I've heard loud and clear from the community, and by the way, I, I support public transit opportunities. I don't believe that the public would have voted for the smart train coming in if they believed it was going to be, in essence, a way to uh, spur high-density development that didn't otherwise make sense for our community. So what I've done is take a leadership role in my community in striking the right balance. For example, at the Civic Center Station, we decided not to have a high-density uh, designation there, a PDA. 
but we worked with the community and came up with a great station area plan that's going to meet the objectives we have, and it's going to do it in a way that's consistent with what makes Marin unique. Very low-impact development, bicycle and pedestrian access, and ultimately uh, improving our communities. I believe that downtown station is going to be world-class and very much looking forward to working with the community on that. All right, thank you. The next question, we'll start with Damon. Uh, given that you were both involved in the creation and goals of Marin Clean Energy, how can MCE achieve its stated goal of 100% locally sourced renewable generation? Do you agree with the Board of Supervisors' vote to overrule the Planning Commission's approval of the Greenpoint Solar Project? Well, I love this question. As the uh, chair of the Marine Clean Energy Program, I've really seen it uh, develop into something that's an, a model statewide and in the nation. The county absolutely can do more to step up, partner with MCE to spur local renewable projects. That's ultimately the goal of MCE, and that's what we're now doing. We have a program called the Feed-In Tariff, which incentivizes small local projects. You may have heard of the San Rafael Airport project. Maybe you didn't know we had an airport in San Rafael, but we do. Uh, it's the first of its kind project. We're actually going to be building a one megawatt project at the Buck Center uh, as a parking structure uh, there. And due to our partnership now with the city of Richmond, we have even more uh, opportunities to do local projects. We're actually building incentives into our new contracts uh, for um, uh, people to actually build local projects within our service territory. I actually would have voted yes on the uh, local project proposed at the Greenpoint Nursery in Novato. Uh, my opponent was absent for that vote. Um, it, it narrowly uh, pa did not pass. I would have taken a different approach on that. Going forward, what we need to do is come up uh, with guidelines where if we're going to talk the talk, let's walk the walk as a county. The way we're going to uh, re significantly reduce greenhouse gas emissions is local projects. It's not going to be huge wind and solar farms. It's going to be on rooftops. Another great thing that Marin Clean Energy is doing is if you overproduce solar on your own roof, uh, the program will actually buy it back from you at retail. Uh, yet another way to spur local investment and supply. Well, I'm really glad I offered Damon the opportunity to chair Marin Clean Energy when I cast the deciding vote to launch the program. And we invested $2 million up front from county dollars as a loan with the payback um, that came back within six months because the program was working really well. Um, I, I wasn't um, at the vote, the first um, hearing for the solar project. I was in Washington, D.C., um, working on some issues for our community. But when I came back for the second hearing, I am on the record as having supported um, the solar project. It was a 3-2. And as a result of it not passing, the direction to staff was that we need to create an ordinance that actually identifies where the appropriate places are in our community um, for solar installations that include um, our, some of the um, facilities like the commercial um, facility that the uh, nursery is on, but also on our roofs and our businesses. Um, we have opportunities through the new um, version of the PACE program for our businesses to um, create a solar that will um, help to offset our uh, greenhouse gases. And in the county, we have solar on our Marin Center. We have solar on our maintenance building. We have solar at the Health and Wellness Campus where we're Gold Lead certified. And we just installed a half a megawatt of solar on the new public safety building that we're going to be opening on May 10th um, at the Marin Commons. Um, the county's also installed a great deal of charging stations now. We're, we're, trans we're moving our motor pool from gas um, vehicles to hybrids, hybrid electrics, and electric vehicles. 
And the goal of Marin Energy was supposed to be off the fossil fuel grid in the next 10 years. I think this is an area that Damon and I have both been supportive. I've brought Damon to Humboldt where we were able to make a presentation to the Humboldt Board of Supervisors to get them excited about the idea of starting their own CCA. So I'm hoping it spreads like a virus. Okay, thank you. The next question is uh, directed towards Susan Adams to start. A woman we know moved here from San Diego to revitalize an underused local library. She works eight to 10 hours a day, six days a week. The only place she can afford to rent is in Vallejo, making her daily commute one and a half hours each way. Where in Marin County can we find or build affordable housing for her and our other service employees, teacher, teachers, nurses, fire and police staff? Well, this is a really huge challenge for us. We live in a county where 80% of our land is protected open space. Our, our um, planners and our community and civic leaders from years ago decided that our inland and coastal areas would be protected and the urban corridor would be the focus of development. Um, we have the highest rents of any county in the whole state of California, if not the country. Um, affordable housing for people, for low income people, is based on the median income of our community, which is about $90,000 a year. So, affordable housing for low income means a family of four earning $65,000. We have homeless mothers living in cars with their kids. 200 of our children in Marin County are homeless. We have veterans who've served our country living under um, overpasses. And so we're, we, we are having some real challenges at the county when we have people in treatment and services and they're getting stabilized and then there's no place for them to go to continue um, the work that we're doing. Um, I've been engaging my community in Marinwood for over eight years now on the idea of redevelopment for the Marinwood Plaza and we just launched our, our environmental um, impact uh, process and we're gonna be going through that process to determine whether or not there's an opportunity on the 101 corridor at that derelict strip mall where there've been drug deals and graffiti and vandalism to repurpose that for a mixed use with housing and commercial. Extremely important question. And what I'd like to focus on first is what unites us as a community rather than divides us because this is a contentious issue. What unites us is we all agree that we need to provide a range of housing opportunities for people at different incomes in our community. We need to allow people better opportunities to live close to where they work. We wanna believe, and I have two uh, college-age daughters, that our own children can actually come back and live uh, in our community at some point. We have a rapidly aging senior population uh, we're all kind of getting to that point as well, uh, me included. We need to provide more opportunities uh, for seniors. But what I'm hearing and what I believe is the only solu the solution is not only to provide high density housing along the freeway. We can be more creative and what I will tell you is when Marin residents get creative and put their minds to it, we can actually lead the way in coming up with other solutions. There are alternative ways to achieve these goals. And in San Rafael, we have a great track record. When there is new development, we make sure a certain percentage is affordable. We're looking at ways to provide more uh, renovations and conversions of existing housing into affordable housing, which is better for the environment. We're looking at second units, and there's some very entrepreneurial ideas going around about even using existing housing and creating second units within it. So what I'll commit to you is tapping into the innovation of our residents. We can come up with more solutions. I happen to oppose the Marinwood Plaza development as it's currently planned. I think we can do better and, and have a more environmental solution. Okay, thank you. The next question will start with Damon. Homelessness is a reality in San Rafael and in the county. What should Marin County do to help house and heal the homeless? This is literally the number one issue uh, I hear about as a council member, particularly as it pertains to uh, our downtown area. 
it's a complex issue. There's not one single solution, but we are actually tackling the issue uh, in a number of innovative ways. One is the downtown streets team, which some of you uh, may see along 4th Street. Well, we're actually putting the homeless to work. Uh, Twelve of the graduates of those programs have now actually gotten full-time jobs uh, in and near 4th Street. We want to expand that program. We have a mental health officer uh, working with our police to address the serious issues uh, with our homeless population. And, of course, we support the social services provided by the Ritter Center and other organizations. That having been said, this is a countywide issue, and it demands countywide solutions. I don't believe the county is stepping up enough in three different ways. One is that the county mental health budget is $46 million. How is that money being spent? One of the first things I'll do is get in there and take a fresh look at those numbers. Is there more we can be doing to support our local communities in helping the homeless? The second is chronic inebriation. Right now, we only have the Helen Vine Center in the county, 25 beds. Oftentimes, uh, those who are chronically inebriated end up in jail cells or emergency rooms. That's not the way to accomplish uh, what we need to. And finally, we need to find a permanent location to house the homeless. Uh, that's something we're actively working on in San Rafael. The county needs to step up as well. Uh, it's something I will focus on, including providing necessary services to the homeless uh, as part of that. Well, homelessness is an issue that's facing all of our cities and counties across the country, um, mostly as a result of this big recession. In 2005, I launched the Homeless Policy Coordinating Committee for the county, which brings together cities, towns, providers, and health and human services to identify those areas that we should be focusing on to try to address this issue. The county is doing a lot. We just met with your mayor today and um, with uh, Councilwoman Collin, and they were very appreciative of the amount of work and support that we've given um, in terms of helping address this issue. The county fully funds the 55 beds at Mill Street. We administer McKinney Vento funds that provide shelter plus care for mentally ill homeless. Um, we have Prop 63 funds, which are providing homeless um, and mentally ill people with extra services and wraparound services so they can be successful. We've, uh, I, I was instrumental in helping us produce the STAR program, which diverts nonviolent mentally ill people into treatment instead of jail. And we've, te we've dealt with uh, almost 200 of these individuals severely mentally ill. They are now housed and working, and we've reduced the recidivism by 85%. We're one of the few counties in the state of California that has empty jail beds. I was also able to access 35 Section 8 vouchers for homeless veterans called VASH vouchers. These were the only vouchers that were not sequestered. And the reality is that five years ago when we were doing our one-day counts for homeless, we counted 1,900 homeless people countywide. That includes West Marin, Southern Marin. About half of those individuals are in San Rafael, and the majority of them are actually long-term residents. Last year, there was 933. So with the services that the county has been investing into helping address this, we've reduced the count by half, but it's still not enough, and we still have more work to do, and I'm still committed to partnering with San Rafael as we find those solutions. Okay, thank you. Our last question of the first five is starting with Susan Adams. The county is impacted by climate changes, including sea level rise, drought, and threat of fire. Marin County currently is updating its climate change action plan. Other than Marin Clean Energy, what is the most effective action the county can take to reduce its contribution to climate change? Well, this is one of the most important issues I think that we're dealing with as a country and, and the planet is how do we address climate change and sea level rise. And I have a community in my district, Santa Venetia, 
that it resides below sea level, that has about $28 million worth of work that needs to be done there to keep those homes protected. But we can't build our way out of climate change. So we're looking at innovative things through a study we've launched in the county parks that's looking at how do we restore marshlands and let nature help us in absorbing some of the waters that are coming in through healthy marsh systems. The county, as I said earlier, has installed EV charging stations. We're putting solar on our um, on our rooftops. Um, the, we approved the grant, the launch grant for SEL, and I'm very happy to see so many students here that are doing project-based learning because you all are going to be the people that are going to help get us out of this pickle um, one of these days, but we have, we're starting now. Um, the other thing that's very exciting that I've been working on is the Marin Carbon Project. And that's an opportunity for us to look at how we use a mixture of different composts to improve our grass rangelands, which sequester carbon. It's a, it was a pilot uh, for five years with the UC Davis Extension. There were three ranches in West Marin that were part of this pilot. And not only were we sequestering um, carbon deep into the seven meter below the ground roots, but we were also retaining seven to eight percent more water. When I took the Bay Area Air Quality Management team out to visit these sites, um, there, those three ranches were the only ones that still had green grass, and this was before the rains came. As a result, Bay Area Air Quality Management is working with me on creating some regulations that would allow cap and trade funds to be directed to our ranchers and farmers so that they can be part of the climate change solution. Uh, real quickly, Jesse, just a, I, I need to correct something Supervisor Adams said about the fact that the uh, homeless population has been cut in half. Uh, you're referring to point in time uh, calculations. Those are notoriously inaccurate. Um, many homeless do not participate. They're not counted. Uh, even those administering the studies recognize that they're inaccurate. The fact is it's a growing problem we need to address it. And I think it's a prime example of how the city and county need to work better and show leadership. Climate change and uh, uh, the policies we can implement is something I've been thoroughly focused on. I actually chair the uh, Centerfell Sustainability Committee. Uh, I wrote the Climate Change Action Plan uh, with uh, the community and my colleagues. Uh, the first of its kind in Marin County, and we're well on our way to implementing it. Uh, so let me just uh, talk about a few things that we're doing. Uh, one is a renewed focus on bicycle and pedestrian access, uh, which is going to be key. I'm a big supporter of public transit, including the smart station. In addition to working through Marine Clean Energy, I'm pushing the city on renewable energy. We were the first city in Marin to install electric vehicle charging stations. San Rafael is actually leading a three-county effort to install solar on municipal buildings. So again, uh, showing leadership that I think I can also bring uh, to the county. We're leading the way on energy efficiency. We're also um, taking important steps on zero waste. Many of you may have heard of our food waste to energy program, which is very innovative. Uh, food scraps are now going to be converted into energy uh, through the efforts and leadership of San Rafael. The county actually has overall has a great recycling rate in terms of residents, but the county itself less than 50%. We need to walk the walk. Okay, thank you to both of the candidates. Uh, at this time, we are going to read three questions that were submitted by Marinsol students. And uh, none of these questions have been uh, given to the candidates in advance. So we will start with Damon as we keep our back and forth. Uh, the first question comes from a Marinsol junior, Sammy McLaughlin. How do you propose protecting Marin's open space while also fulfilling the increasing need of affordable housing? And you also have two minutes for these questions. One thing we need to do is make sure that policies that are being pushed on our local communities make sense. Right now, there's a huge issue with state mandates and regional mandates uh, uh, being pushed through uh, number requirements of, about housing. 
uh, that make little sense for our community. And we really saw this through the uh, priority development area debate. So one thing I will commit to doing is fighting for our communities to make sure that those numbers make sense. What makes Marin unique is our zoning where we've protected open space, and that's really consistent with our local values. I don't believe high density housing is the only solution or even the solution uh, to our affordable housing uh, needs. As I mentioned in a previous answer, I think we can be way more creative and looking at, at other options and in that sense lead the way. I'd like to look at ways of converting existing housing into more affordable housing through conversions, renovations, I think second units, uh, particularly through some of the entrepreneurial efforts we're seeing in Marin, uh, make a lot of sense. My opponent ran on a, a no development platform. Many of you may remember St. Vincent Silvera's. I happen to agree with her uh, on that approach. I think that land uh, has uh, particular significance culturally, environmentally for our region. The county's now calling for up to 221 units there. A full 70% of all house, new housing called for in unincorporated Marin is called for within District 1, our district. That's too much. What I'm willing to do is toe the line, come up with a vision for the community of a level of housing that makes sense using all the resources at our disposal. So here's the deal on the St. Vincent Silvera when I was first running. San Rafael had in their general plan slated for 2,100 units of housing and a few hundred thousand square feet of commercial. And after my election, I worked very hard to remove the, that land from the San Rafael sphere of influence. It came back into the county through public process and our general plan process. I wasn't able to get the third vote for no growth there, but I was able to move the envelope so that we were down to 221 max, 121 market rate, and 100 only if St. Vincent's had at one time proposed creating a senior unit on their H complex for low-income seniors. So it would only be if there was a low-income project. There are still cows eating grass out at St. Vincent Silvera after 12 years of me being in office. And I just worked with the San Rafael, um, uh, the Santa Venetia community to purchase Heron Hill. And that had, had been slated for 10 big houses that is now going to be permanently protected through private um, owners that are transferring those rights over to the county. And so I think my environmental credentials are pretty solid in that area. But Damon is talking about 71% of affordable housing. He's talking about a total of unincorporated, and all of unincorporated, 185 units. What I'm not hearing is how is San Rafael going to deal with 107, 1,000, I'm sorry, 1,007 units that San Rafael is supposed to create. And yes, second units and conversions are important, but the state will not certify you going forward unless they see that you have a record of creating those numbers from previous cycles. In the last cycle, only five property owners were submitted plans for second units. So we don't get to count a whole lot if we, if we submit that to the state. They won't certify it, and that was part of the problem that we've had. Um, I'm also, I helped to craft AB 1537 that would put us back into a suburban density of 20 units per acre, and I'm working very closely in Sacramento with our legislator on that. Thank you. Our next question comes from a Marin Sol freshman, Kathleen Waterbury, and this is for Susan Adams to start with. What is your position on cap and trade systems in California? Do you think they are working, and do you think we should be doing something else to control carbon emissions? Um, cap and trade is sort of a complicated issue because the, the governor is actually taking a pretty big chunk of the money that we said we wanted to direct in cap and trade to put into the high speed rail system that wants that's going to go up and down the state. I think um, there are some exciting opportunities, as I mentioned earlier, with the Marin Carbon Project. One of our top 10 targeted industries in Marin County is agriculture. That's something that San Rafael hasn't had to deal with, but I've worked a lot with our agricultural community. And I think that there is an opportunity for us to have some 
really significant impacts on climate change through sequestering and also in retaining water. Drought issues are something that we're going to have to deal with. We have a little breather now because we got enough rain that we don't have to do mandatory um, rationing, but this is still an issue that we're going to have to address. Um, the, the, the input um, into putting solar on all of our roofs, there was a, a Facebook um, program that, re that went around showing in Germany Every new building, every new home had a solar roof on top of it, and we're self-generating. And I think we need to start taking a look at how do we make the permits easier so that people can do this. And our county is taking those steps right now. There should be also some integration so that when somebody comes to put in a, 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 a contractor wants to put in a solar, the rules aren't different between Fairfax and the county and San Rafael. So there are some... some um, uh, there is some work that we can still do in this area. But I also think that we each have a personal obligation to look at how we use energy and how we use resources in our own lives. And how even just things like energy efficiencies in our home, um, whether we're going to take public transit or have a car-free day one day a week. And I think that that impact, even though it's small and it's personal, if all of us took that personal responsibility, we could make some really significant changes. So my view is cap and trade is a mixed bag. Um, the theory is that it permits uh, companies to pollute, but they can pay essentially for the privilege and theoretically offset. I think the more environmental approach, which I originally supported, would be to put hard limits and reduce those over time and in effect charge a carbon tax uh, to accurately uh, price uh, pollution. Um, I think that's where you would get the uh, transformative change uh, that we need to really combat climate change at the level of the, of the problem it truly is uh, for all of us. Uh, but uh, cap and trade represented a compromise. Um, it's what we have. Um, I, too, share the concern that uh, uh, it looks like, and perhaps not surprisingly, a lot of the money being generated by the program is essentially going to uh, uh, random general fund um, purposes. What I'd like to see, given, again, the, uh, uh, the gravity of the issue we're facing with climate change, that the money be filtered back directly to uh, programs that mitigate it, because um, there's a lot we can do at the local level, but as we're seeing, we need state and federal money. Uh, sea level rise is a perfect example, uh, and San Rafael has a lot of shoreline area. Santa Venetia, as has been mentioned, um, these are huge issues we need to deal with. How can we transform dike baylands back into wetlands to create horizontal levees, a natural way to deal with flooding? How can we bolster our levees and make other infrastructure improvements that we need to make? Uh, it costs a tremendous amount of money, and uh, I, I just feel like let's get the cap-and-trade money into programs like that. Okay, thank you. Our last question of pre-submitted pre questions from the Marinsol students comes from a Marinsol junior, Claire Parkinson, and this will be for Damon to start. In your eyes, what is the number one environmental issue facing Marin County at the present moment, and what are your plans to address this issue? Right now, I believe the number one issue uh, environmentally is how we're going to develop as a community and how development will affect our community. For me, uh, overdeveloping uh, Marin would be a, a tragedy. Um, it, what makes Marin unique is our local values of low impact development. At the same time, we recognize we need uh, new housing. Uh, so for me, what I would like to do is work with the community to come up with a vision. Right now at the county level, that vision is lacking. I talked about uh, the statistics in terms of District 1. I think as a first step, and the basis of why I'm running is to bring decision making back to the local level to tap into the community. We need local community plans. Uh, for example, Lucas Valley, which is one area in the district, 
has been asking for a plan for about 10 years. Uh, the ca county has not stepped up yet and determined uh, how that that can be uh, implemented uh, with residents in that area. Santa Venetia, there is a process going on. Um, I think it can serve as a model. In essence, what the local community plan will do will allow the community to weigh in on how development should occur, how it affects local services, uh, how it impacts the environment, what is the best way that we should be uh, developing moving forward. I would say that is the number one issue uh, in this race. It's where my opponent and I uh, differ. And uh, I believe fundamentally I have a different vision in how I would work with the community in resolving these uh, issues. Well, I think the overarching most important issue that we're dealing with is climate change and what's going to happen to our environment unless we take some pretty significant um, actions to try to turn that around. And it's not likely to get turned around in my lifetime, but we need to start. Housing is part of that discussion. When you have more than half of our workforce commuting from out of county to come into our community to, to um, be part of the fabric of our workforce, and we're, we're creating that problem of congestion on 101. When, it's just not true that Lucas Valley has been asking for 10 years. We've uh, talked to Lucas Valley before. Actually, the Lucas Valley Homeowners Asso Association has a very um, good architectural plan, and we converse with them every time something comes up in that community. But community plans are important. The, 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 the issues around housing, um, you know, I, I'm, there was a time, Damon, when you and I agreed that infill was an important um, part of what we were going to have to do. And there Still are do. certainly high density developments up and down the 101 corridor that have been there for decades, three to five story projects that San Rafael has has um, approved. The most recent one was at 33 San Pablo. It's a four story 88 unit facility right off of the 101 that the city of San Rafael approved. And in contrast, the county has not approved one multifamily unit in the first district, even though there are areas that are zoned for it. Now, will it get, will these areas that are zoned get built? Well, that'll depend on the public process. And we in Marin County are one of the slowest growing counties in the whole Bay Area. We're getting less than 1% of the growth. Most of the growth is going to Oakland, San Jose, and San Francisco because they want those transit dollars. We have very little growth that's gonna be coming here. And for us to only have to find 185 units in Marin when San Francisco is looking at trying to find 40,000 units for sites um, shows the, the contrast in what it is we're dealing with. So we have work to do and certainly the community is gonna be involved and engaged as they always are. Okay, thank you very much. At this time, we're going to begin asking questions that were submitted from the audience and the same time limit of two minutes uh, response by each candidate and uh, we will then follow up with uh, a final brief question uh, that we will ask that's pre that we have written down here. And then each candidate will give a three minute summary at the end before we close. So that's, that's the agenda for the rest of the evening. The first question from the audience is, a key factor of sustainable development is concentrating housing and work along transportation corridors. Do you support or reject our innovative 1973 countywide plan. And this will start with Susan Adams. I support that plan. I, I think that our um, the rebels with a cause had a great idea, but in order to protect all those coastal lands and the inland rural agricultural areas, the focus for growth was along the 101 corridor and the Sir Francis Strait corridor. And that's what, that's what we have been committed to. ABAG and the counties have finally come online about do we really want to sprawl and look like LA and have everybody driving miles and miles and miles to get to where they need to be. The other issue around that is in transportation with limited transportation dollars and no gas taxes raised in the last 20 years and now people driving hybrids, hybrid electrics and electrics, there's very limited funding for us to be able to provide this, the funds that we need to for roads. So what ABAG was asking is, 
where do we get the most bang for the buck as we're looking at transit-oriented development where businesses and people can be having access to public transit. I'm really proud of the role that I played in our public transit system, which has now increased bus ridership significantly. We have three shuttles that are clean burning fuel shuttles moving through our community that have twice as many people riding in them than we anticipated. I ride the public transit. I took Dick Spotswood on a little ride with me so he could see it before he starts writing more articles about it. And, and, and I think that, you know, there's a lot of people that don't realize it. It's one of the best kept secrets in Marin County still. So if we can improve and make it easier for people to choose non-auto options, improve our bike and pedestrian pathways, and we've been doing that in Marin, um, we have other alternatives besides having people get into their cars. So I, I, th I think that, you know, we've, we've been making some good progress. But the housing piece is going to be a really important piece. We have very limited areas left for us to be able to look at as housing opportunity sites and their infill areas. Thank you. So I also support the uh, 73 countywide plan and uh, very much admired the movie Rebels with the Cause. Uh, again, it, it was really how Marin folks stepped up and, and led the way. Uh, but we're really being presented with a false choice uh, to suggest that somehow if we support that visionary plan uh, that we have to accept uh, levels of development uh, in uh, the 101 area uh, that are not appropriate for Marin and not consistent uh, with our local values. Um, Supervisor Adams, I absolutely agree uh, that infill uh, near transit uh, uh, makes sense. That's what we've done in San Rafael near downtown uh, in particular. Uh, but to suggest that high density housing along the freeway is the go to solution, um, I, I believe lacks imagination and creativity. It's not an either or situation. And what many people feel is uh, what's really driving it? Is it uh, uh, a regional agency like ABAG? Uh, trying to call the shots for us. And I'll note that you were the vice president of ABAG uh, during the time period where the priority development uh, proposals were uh, coming to Marin. I think we need to look, take a fresh look and make sure that we're uh, in tune with what makes Marin unique. There are absolutely issues that we need to address with housing. We can do it in a more environmental way uh, than what's currently be, being proposed under your leadership. I've been a staunch supporter of public transit throughout my career, throughout my life. I'm a user of public transit. Uh, I've consistently supported SMART. Uh, you uh, have not over time. Um, and I just think we need to actually have someone uh, ready to step up and lead. Thank you. This next question is to start with Damon. and rolls right into the public transit question. What do you think would be the most expedient way to improve pu public transit in Marin? It's really got to be a multimodal approach. Um, so I want to make sure that SMART is successful, uh, make sure that it stays fiscally on track. Um, again, I see a situation, uh, particularly with the downtown San Rafael uh, station, where it can be world class and really set set the tone uh, throughout the region and, and even beyond. Uh, with our ethos, I believe we can continue and even more so be the leader on bicycle and pedestrian options. Um, I actually was part of a delegation that went over to the Netherlands, not on taxpayer expense, uh, but we actually studied international best practices on um, uh, how communities can better improve those uh, opportunities. It's what I've been coming back and talking about uh, more locally here. I'd like to see the county even be more of a leader on that. Uh, public transit, it's something I've uh, uh, ridden all my life. Um, in fact, in 2011, when my car died after 10 years, I went a full year without a car just to check out what's happening in Marin. Good news is we have great regional bus services. We, we have um, mediocre local bus services right now in terms of getting around, 
a 15 minute drive can turn into about a 90 minute bus ride. So one thing I'll focus on is uh, how can we improve our routes? Uh, Supervisor Adams mentioned shuttles. We need to make sure those pencil out financially, but that's one option. Uh, a lot of our community relies on local transit. Uh, and in fact, I'd like to incentivize all of us to ride it more. So we just need to improve the service. So the multimodal approach, I agree with um, Damon about that. And we're doing it. We've created class one and class two pathways through my district. We opened the Cal Park Tunnel that connects Central San Rafael to Larkspur Ferry. Um, the shuttle buses are penciling out. All that information is available on, in the public records of all of our meetings. In fact, we only need to have seven or eight riders per hour on the shuttles in order to make them pencil out. And we typically get anywhere from 11 to 15 riders per hour. So they've been very successful. On the issue of SMART, um, Damon was a supporter, and I did raise the issue at that time that the federal uh, transit agency people, when I asked them to look at the business plan, said that the assumptions for federal dollars come with the assumption that you're going to create an average of 2,000 units of housing within a half a mile of train stations. And that would, if that's part of the budget, then you need to be looking at that as an option if you want to tap into those dollars. The other issue was that the sales tax was not asking for the right amount of money for the program to deliver. When you ask the taxpayers to fund something, you better darn well ask them for the right amount so you can deliver what it is you promised them. And the promise was for a train system to start from Cloverdale and went to Larkspur, and it wasn't enough. The Transit DC guy said you probably need at least a half a cent sales tax, but politically it didn't poll as well, so they didn't ask the voters for that amount. Then the recession hit. So I was raising the questions during that time. I like the idea of trains. We're gonna get the train. Um, hopefully we'll get it all the way to the Larkspur station with the, with the funds that are available, but the housing issue was Part of it, which is why I think you were proud that you led the steering committee on the station area plan. And when San Rafael decided to pull the plug on the station area plan in the PDA, we lost the $150,000 from the MTC that would have helped fund our bike and pedestrian and roundabout services. Thank you. The next question is starting with Susan Adams. There is a lot of talk about varying types of development. What is not discussed is where will the water come from to support such development? Specifically, where is the water going to come from? Do you support desalinization plants? And do you advocate very little growth as an answer? We do have a water issue. In fact, 25% of our water comes from Sonoma County through the Russian River. And Sonoma is growing very quickly. And as they uh, decide that perhaps they need to turn down the spigot on us, we're going to have some pretty serious challenges. I think that part of the issue is that we're not using our water well enough that we already have. We still have a lot of big homes in Marin County that like tropical gardens in a Mediterranean environment. We have a lot of homes that are using full-on multi-spigot showers so that they can get the full massage treatment while they're getting waking up in the morning and not enough low-flow toilets. That's just the easy stuff. But then we need to start looking at how do we use our gray water. And only 2% of our water currently is being utilized through our gray water sources. A lot of our water gets flushed down drains and toilets that we could be recapturing and using for irrigation. The Las Galinas San Sanitary District um, has been working in the North Bay watershed groups to look at how we can try to access more funding to be able to put more pink and or purple pipe um, throughout our community and really use that as a resource. And then finally, one of the things the county is looking at now is how can we um, permit people to use to capture their shower water um, or the water that comes out of their sinks into irrigation tubes that will go right into their backyards. Um, we're working through the details on that right now so that we're having a, a closed system. And then finally, rainwater catchment. And there are some of the um, homes, especially the bigger homes, we're requiring if you're building something that's bigger than 7,000 square feet, you have to have zero net water.
water uh, use. So you have to find ways to use recycled and reclaimed water and low flow and be able to uh, demonstrate that you're not uh, taking water from the, the watershed. Um, we, are, we launched a, a forum at the county and we're gonna continue these conversations with our water districts. Thank you. Well, I've got to start by just saying uh, we did not vote against the station area plan. We approved it under my leadership. We rescinded the priority development area, and it did not cost the community $150,000. We were threatened with that. Uh, we, didn't, we weren't convinced that we were either going to lose or gain sufficient money. Lo and behold, after the vote, the money materialized. So that is going toward the Civic Center Drive improvements. Water is a key issue. I agree with MMWD's call on the community to uh, voluntarily conserve 25% uh, of water, uh, given our drought conditions. It's a goal that the city of San Rafael has embraced. Uh, what we've done is actually as part of our sustainability efforts, uh, coming up with ways of engaging the local community on further ways to conserve water, uh, in particular through a program called Resilient Neighborhoods. We're going out through clergy uh, or, or congregations uh, in town educating and engaging on how to uh, reduce water use in, usage in homes and I will say the Marin School of Environmental Leadership uh, has been involved in that program. So thank you, you guys. Um, we can even do more on that. I absolutely uh, uh, agree with the premise of the question that uh, uh, any new development should be tied to uh, availability of water. Uh, it's currently part of state law. Uh, and it's something we have to adhere to locally um, as we make these key decisions that we've been talking about tonight about how we're going to develop uh, and when. Uh, we're entering a situation with sea level rise where water is even going to become more of an issue. Uh, so we have to get on top of it. Okay, thank you very much. The next question, we'll start with Damon. What are you doing in your lifestyle, lifestyle to advocate and practice eco-sustainability currently? So, um, taking public transit, uh, riding my bike uh, whenever I can. Um, I'm 100% deep green. That's one of the options in, uh, through, offered through Marin Clean Energy. Um, I'm encouraging the uh, city of San Rafael uh, to go 100% deep green. Uh, maybe I can make a plug for that to everyone in the room as well. It literally uh, is probably the single best way uh, that uh, we can achieve um, uh, sustainability and reduce our carbon footprint uh, as local communities. And again, we're hoping to even uh, encourage other communities to follow our lead on that. Uh, at home, um, I'm, I'm constantly reminding myself now to uh, shut off lights, uh, conserve water, turn off the water while uh, shaving and brushing my teeth. It's, it's really li little things like that uh, that we all can do. Um, and as a public official, um, I've dedicated my service to environmental leadership. Um, there's a lot of things you can focus on. Uh, when you're when you're in these roles and uh, what I've chosen to do is um, through my chairmanship of Marine Clean Energy through my chairmanship of the City Sustainability Committee is go out and work extensively with the community on ways we can reduce uh, our contributions to climate change as I mentioned to start out with I believe we, we are Marin County I mean, we should be the national leaders in doing this. And just looking, even in this room, the leadership here, uh, the passion, that's what I want to tap into as your county supervisor. And I, I know we can uh, accomplish amazing things. Well, I'm also doing all those same things. Damon and I have had lots of bagel chats at the Northgate Bagel Shop. And, and um, you, you'll probably find that we aren't too different on too many of the policies, especially related to environment. 
Um, but 100% green is me. Um, I've uh, retrofit my house so that it's energy efficient. I only spend about $25 a month on my energy bill as a result. I ride my bike, I use public transit, not as much while I've been on the campaign trail, but we'll get back to that after June 3rd. And um, I, I worked with Supervisor McGlashan on the subcommittee that launched our plastic bag ban. Um, San Rafael just recently um, joined us in that, and, uh, and Fairfax was ahead of the county even in that. So hopefully um, we will be plastic bag free. Um, we also banned polystyrene single use. Um, I was one of the earliest owners of a hybrid vehicle. In fact, I'm still driving the darn thing around. It's got 160,000 miles on it now and still going strong. And um, I, I'm working currently for the last three years on the green committee of the San Rafael Chamber. And we're working on trying to green up our businesses because I think we get a lot of bang for the buck there. As a result, our chamber has endorsed me for the reelection. And also, um, the Sierra Club has endorsed me because of my long history and taking some really difficult votes. Taking, being the deciding vote to launch clean energy um, put a lot of political blowback on me. And I was ready and willing to take that heat. And it was the right decision. It was the right thing to do. It gives the community choice now between two agencies. But we also have um, PG&E launching a piece of legislation now trying to undermine, once again, the implementation of CCA. I think it's AB 2145. So letters in opposition would be really helpful for that. And um, finally, you know, I think that, that, again, it goes back to personal responsibility. If we all do a little bit, we can make a big difference. Great. Thank you. And this question ties into that. Uh, as county supervisor, how can you help increase incentives for citizens and homeowners to become more green themselves by, for example, installing home uh, solar and wind power uh, incentives to be green certified and reduce waste, whether it's uh, residential or business, and re-energize the, the zero waste goal of Marin? Um, the county actually ha has launched um, over the years re rebates for solar retrofit. So besides what you might get from PG&E, we've also helped in, in terms of helping um, our um, residents be able to find some extra dollars to make the incentive work. Um, we've also done a program for wood-burning stoves. I don't know how many of you have driven through the San Geronimo Valley in the middle of the winter when all the fireplaces are going, but all of that particular particulate matter and, and black carbon is not good for our lungs or the environment and does contribute um, significantly. So our focus with our rebate programs have always been in trying to help people do the right thing. And it's not a lot, but sometimes it's just enough um, for the incentive. We're also looking at right now, and, and I think in the fall we're going to have the ordinance coming back to us that's going to look at streamlining rules for how we can get people easier access to put their um, solar on their roofs. Um, permitting costs, whether you're in the city or the county, can be really prohibitive for some people. And so we're trying to find those incentives by reducing fees and costs to allow people the opportunity to do the right thing. And with a checklist that if you do X, Y, and Z, you get the fast track through. Um, we've also set up a system at our county planning office where the county planners, the public works, the fire guys are all looking at those plans for those different kinds of, um, of projects that we're doing in our own homes to be clean and green so that you can go in and hopefully in the same day leave with your permit uh, for doing the project. Um, the, the other thing is that there are funds available. I serve on the Bay Area Air Quality Management District, and we're looking at um, accessing some of the dollars that come through them for charging stations, for um, wood-burning smoke, for um, bicycle programs, and um, I think there's a lot of opportunities through our regional agencies to continue to tap into some of those resources. I think this is really an example of where the uh, county needs to walk the walk. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, in the county, residents have about a 75% uh, diversion or recycling rate, uh, one of the highest in the state. Yet Marin County at the Civic Center is down at 45%. 
uh, which is inexplicable to me. I think uh, when county government is seeking to uh, incentivize or uh, encourage other people to act a certain way, we should be acting that way ourselves um, as county leaders. That's something I'd like to change. In terms of zero waste, I'm very encouraged by this new uh, proposal that um, San Rafael has taken the lead on, and that's uh, food waste to energy, where through Marin Sanitary Service, um, uh, commercial restaurants uh, and businesses that uh, produce food scraps, uh, Marin Sanitary will recycle those and actually turn it into energy. Uh, working through the county, I'd like to see that kind of program um, expand as part of our recycling uh, efforts. As I mentioned, San Rafael is taking a three-county lead in the solar seed program, which actually encourages solar on municipal rooftops. Um, I'd like to see the county uh, take a lead in that uh, with the city of San Rafael and Marin Clean Energy. Not everyone can have solar on their roofs for a variety of reasons. So there's a new program that we're developing through Marin Clean Energy that will actually allow residents to tap into small local projects uh, for uh, a fixed price at cost uh, that will further incentivize people to uh, tap into solar, even if they can't otherwise have it on their own roofs. So it's those kind of innovative programs that I think with my experience, both through Marin Clean Energy and on sustainability issues, we can further uh, go forward with. Thank you. The next question, are you willing to champion and promote protecting historic Lucas Valley Road with scenic historic road designation? Uh, yes. Um, very interesting proposal that's come, uh, been come up with by residents in the Lucas Valley area. It essentially would be a way of designating uh, the stretch of Lucas Valley Road out to Nicasio, and this is something I'd uh, like to work with Supervisor Steve Kinsey on, since that goes to his district, in designating that portion of the highway as a scenic road. Uh, what are the benefits to the community? It's a way of another form of local planning. Uh, we talked about the local community plan earlier. I can see this as being part of it. Um, in talking about it further with the community, um, some of the questions I was initially asking is, because it's a state program, do you lose local control? Um, my concerns in that regard have been satisfied, and I believe the benefits of the program would outweigh uh, uh, those issues. Uh, my understanding is right now um, the uh, county is evaluating that issue. Um, if I'm elected at, or when I'm elected, that is something I would like to uh, uh, champion for the community. Well, the county in the general plan identified one of the many, many programs that it wants to look at as being scenic roads. And there's more beautiful scenic roads in Marin County than just in Lucas Valley. So they want to take a total look at all of our unincorporated, unincorporated areas, whether you're driving um, down Highway 1 along the oceans or in some of our state park areas or through our ag lands. We have some really beautiful roads. Um, it is going to take some staff time. We, re we downsized our staff by 250 people through the recession. So we're, we're operating in a really tight um, staffing situation. Um, I did bring the issue up during our budget hearings. But if we um, put the uh, scenic road project forward, then something else has to come down. And so we're going to be looking at what comes down. Do we not continue working on our local coastal plan? Um, do we not get our housing elements certified? There are some really important planning issues uh, that we're working on right now. But it is coming, but you know the, the timing will be determined when. And at the last meeting, I did not have a majority of, of people on my board, including Supervisor Kinsey, that was interested in displacing something. But we're going to continue that conversation in June. Um, in terms of 
Um, the 43% not diversion rate. I don't know where that number's coming from. Um, that grand that, jury. Well, the, we 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 debated that grand jury number. The grand jury oftentimes makes statements about things that we don't agree with, and we've done a lot of things in our county to um, get rid of uh, waste, including um, our board packets are now on iPads. We do electronic records now. We audio visually webcast the meetings and display those for the people to be able to use them at home rather than sending out um, large documents. And so um, we have been making um, significant strides in that area, and I, I think that um, that 43% uh, is in dispute. Okay, thank you. The next question. Redwood landfill is overfilled and leaching into groundwater and bay waters posing hazards. What can we do for better solutions for safer, safer and sustainable future approaches in dealing with our landfill waste? Well, we've already, you know, sort of talked about the issue of zero waste um, and making sure that we're using as little um, that needs to go into the landfill as possible. Recycling, um, and one of the things that we need state and federal help with is looking at the upstream packaging. How many of you have bought things for your kids or for little ones for Christmas and that little toy comes in a box that's this big with a lot of styrofoam and everything in it? We need to really, we really need to look at how, um, how we can help affect the packaging. And then when things are finished with their use, how do we send it back to the creator of those products so that they can uh, reuse that. Um, I don't know how many of you have bought new phones and how many do you have to buy the new charger and the new plug-in for your car instead of having like a universal charger. There are a lot of things that we can be doing um, to help with that. But the Redwood Landfill, um, it's the, the plan that's on the table now is mostly looking at capturing um, 11 uh, megawatts full of methane energy to be part of our portfolio. It's looking at composting um, and it's looking at recycling so that they can stretch whatever left they have of it um, before it goes away. When it goes away, the question is, well, then where does our garbage go if we haven't well, gone to zero use? Are we loading it up in trucks and sending it to Modesto or Solano? And there's a whole lot of other issues that co go along with um, making those kinds of decisions. Um, the, there was a lot of a controversy about the, the landfill. What, what I understand in the hearings that I've had is that it's not leaching into the water at, at this time, but with a big earthquake, there could be a risk. And if we were going to create a landfill now, that would not be the place we would have put it. But it's been there, and it's ending. It's getting close to its end use, and we're going to have some serious conversations about what we do when we don't get to use that area any longer. Thank you. Well, I absolutely oppose expanding the landfill. I think we need to go in the opposite direction. And one of the issues I've been uh, working on is um, how do we even uh, uh, structure uh, how we actually deal with waste and recycling. Right now we're in a situation where, uh, and this is ironic, if you actually downsize the size of your can, i.e. use less waste, you pay more <laughs> uh, uh, per unit basis uh, through your garbage rate. So one thing I'm spearheading right now is actually rethinking how we even price waste um, through Marin Sanitary Service. Um, and the ultimate goal is really to incentivize actual recycling. And I happen to agree, we have to look all the way up the, uh, uh, the chain, how we're packaging uh, supplies, et cetera. Um, again, we're at 75% right now. The goal should be 100%. I know that Marin Sanitary Service is interested in that. Um, San Rafael is engaged extensively right now. Uh, in working with them on how we're going to come up with a new rate structure to further incentivize uh, recycling and diversion. And ultimately, uh, let's make the Redwood landfill obsolete. Okay, thank you. This question is uh, back to public transit. You are both 
advocating the increased use of bike and pedestrian transit. However, every day we hear the tragic stories of people being hit, injured, and often killed. How do you provide safety measures so that we feel safe to bike and walk? So that went to me? Yes. Great. The, the ultimate um, best solution is obviously to create class one separated bike paths. Um, if we could have those all over town, that would be my dream. Uh, they're very expensive, and, and we need to move in that direction over time. The good news is, though, that there's a number of safety measures we can take short of that huge expense. And again, that's um, some of the issues I learned even in studying internationally on these issues. Signage, for example, uh, putting paint on the ground so there's clear separation uh, between uh, bikes and cars. The big thing is educating the community, both riders and uh, one program both my wife and I have been involved in in that regard uh, is a Safe Routes to Schools program uh, through schools where uh, we actually uh, uh, encourage kids to learn about safe biking from an early age and hopefully those skills uh, last throughout time. But also uh, our uh, folks who are using automobiles. Uh, we need to get uh, more education out in the community about uh, sharing the road, uh, keeping things separate and safe, and uh, there's no, absolutely no reason we need to delay simply because of supposed cost or the Cadillac uh, solution. We do need to ultimately move toward uh, uh, separated bike facilities, so-called class one, but there's a lot of other things we can accomplish through uh, signage, paint, education that we need to be immediately acting upon. And just, I just wanted to go back to a, a, a f another thing about the county that we already have a reduced rate for the smaller cans. Um, but getting to this question, Yes, class one and class two um, bike paths. We opened the Cal Park Tunnel, so there's a very nice, um, safe route for people who are on their feet and with strollers and on bikes to get from the central San Rafael area through to the Larkspur Landing. We're also studying Alto Tunnel that's further down in the Mill Valley area. Um, traffic calming um, can also help with this too. When you, when you make things move a little bit differently, when you put foliage up, when you do other things that help to slow the speeds down, it makes people a little more careful. Um, I've worked very closely with the Marin Bicycle Coalition over the years. They've been part of our community planners and helped us to create our master bike plan for the county. And I believe San Rafael also has a, my, a master bike plan. And as funds become available, we can implement parts of this. Um, Safe Routes to School has been a really important program, but it's not just about getting the kids on their bikes or buses to or or foot pools, walking with, with adults to get to the school. It's also about creating the infrastructure, crossing guards, things that will help the kids move safely so that the parents feel safe about letting their little ones go to school using those methods. And then finally, I just want to say common courtesy um, is missing. <laughs> And we have, a, we have a lot of people in our community that you know, don't think twice about blowing through stop signs, whether they're in a car or on a bike. And when, you try, when I've tried to you know, talk to people about, hey, wait a minute, that was a stop sign, um, sometimes you don't get a very friendly signal from the person's right hand. <laughs> and so um, you know, I think we need to all practice common courtesy and share the road um, safely. OK, thank you. And this is for Susan. How do you define low impact development? With that in mind, how can LID techniques be implemented in municipal projects such as sidewalk replacement, street repair, and public buildings? Okay, can you say that again? Low impact development. So how can low impact development techniques be implemented in municipal projects such as sidewalk replacement, street repair, and public buildings? So I'll use the example of the Marinwood Plaza since that's been something that's come up. And I, I would like to say in the scoping session that more than half of the people that spoke about that project when we first um, opened up the session said they supported it. 
and they had questions about it. How do we, how do we um, look at aesthetics, at traffic, at um, the, the freeway um, exhaust? I brought the community through an eight-year process to dream about how we would transform a derelict strip mall that had drug deals, graffiti, vandalism. The sheriffs were out there regularly. It's, it's an, it was an eyesore, and the only thing left there was a, 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 an alcohol dispensary, a.k.a. liquor store. And the community got together and, and dreamed about what they'd like to see there. No more than 100 units of housing, 20,000 square feet of retail, community serving, community gathering space, walkable and bikeable so that you wouldn't have to get into your car. And over the course of the last couple of years, two market rate developers were not able to pencil it out and make money um, for what the community was looking for. So now what this current proposal is with a nonprofit developer is, is proposing 82 units, that's less than the 100 cap that, that was allowed in the general plan, that the community came to the Board of Supervisors and said that they wanted um, put into the general plan. And within that, the values of the community about the public gathering space, about the community serving retail, walkable, bikeable. And then the questions are really important questions about how do we address being that close to a freeway, the air quality, there's a, a plume from an old dry cleaner that has to get cleaned up. There are a lot of really important issues, but the process will work. And oftentimes what a developer will put in front of us at the county or at the city doesn't look what, like what they get to have at the end of it. So the process will work. And it's really important that the community stays engaged because that's how we get the programs that we want to see in our community. Thank you. Tim. Well, um, I believe a large segment of the community uh, uh, believes you have not been listening to them on the Marinwood Plaza site. Um, that basically the community vision that was put together in uh, 2006 reflected a different vision uh, that then you're now uh, proposing uh, for that site. Something needs to be done there, uh, but what the community is looking for is more of a gathering place and meeting uh, existing community needs uh, like retail with some housing. There are significant environmental issues there. There's a toxic plume. Uh, there's um, uh, high density housing being proposed right next to the freeway and uh, environmental concerns with that. Uh, I think one thing I can bring to the table is pulling the community together and coming up with a plan that, that addresses these, these legitimate concerns. In terms of low impact development, it's been an area of leadership for uh, the city of San Rafael. We actually enacted the toughest green building standards in the nation uh, in San Rafael. And it's something we've been proud of. Um, it's something that we've incorporated um, into uh, uh, new building permits uh, within town. Uh, it's something I'd like to continue to take a leadership role on uh, at the county level. Uh, uh, in the role as a supervisor. Okay, thank you. The next question, can you please address the formula for determining how many units of affordable housing is sustainable and reasonable within Marin, and do you feel that this formula is accurate for Marin County? And that's for Damon to start. So right now, um, we have a default density level of 30 units per acre. I agree with uh, uh, Marin County leaders who have been pushing for a lower default density level uh, through legislation. Um, historically, we've had very limited success or no success in getting that legislation through. I think alternatively, what we need to do as communities is go and advocate for a lower density level, i.e. a more suburban uh, density level uh, at the state level. Uh, Novato successfully did that. Um, they made the case that uh, 30 units per acre as a default was not appropriate uh, for our area. Uh, they got it down to 23. Uh, I think county with uh, good leadership can do that as well. There are some concerns about whether that creates a situation where we give up um, the right uh, of to discretionary review of projects or a so-called buy right. 
uh, a zoning process. Um, I'm a firm believer that uh, the community should be able to use uh, the tools of CEQA or environmental, vigorous environmental review on any new project, so I'm not willing to do that. However, I do believe that uh, uh, perhaps using um, the example of Novato and other communities who have been able to uh, uh, correct the uh, zoning uh, default density levels uh, that we can make progress on that issue. So um, the, form, the 30 unit per acre density doesn't pass a straight face test. And the reason we got lumped into that was because when the housing laws were first created for housing element um, back in 1969 and then revised over the years, we got lumped in with the metropolitan service area of San Francisco and San Mateo County instead of with our North Bay counties. And that was how the state legislature did it back then. So it, when people are looking at 30 unit per acre density, it, it sounds really scary. And we do have examples, even in San Rafael, where there's 30 unit per acre density housing that's been created. Um, but it doesn't pass a straight face as when Sonoma, Solano, and Napa have 20 unit per acre default density. And it doesn't leave it to us at local government to determine whether or not 30 or 40 or whatever or 10 is the right amount for our, our local areas. Novato um, did a buy right clause in their 23 unit per acre. And that means they have given up, so I think, some of the CEQA protections for the public process in order to get that lower density. I worked, I've been working with the nonprofit housing with our California State Association of Counties to craft AB 1537, which Assembly Member Levine is carrying through. It, it got through its first hearing at the Housing Committee on the 30th. It'll have its second hearing. And in that, we're going to get uh, this next housing cycle, the Cole County, including the city and towns, will get the suburban density allocation, and they'll be monitoring us through this next housing cycle to see if we're really actually coming up with a plan that's acceptable by HCD. I've been going back and forth to Sacramento working on this, and I've been making the calls to work on this. I've been proactive. Um, the, the, none of the other city council members in our, in our um, cities that will benefit from this have, have been able to join me yet in this effort. But I think we have a really good chance of making this work, and letters to Mark Levine's office will certainly help the cause. Thank you. We're going to do one final question from the crowd, and then we are going to wrap up with uh, one question from each opponent to each other and a three-minute final summary. The last question, Marin County is very proud of our local agriculture. How do you support local and organic farming, and how are you uh, promoting and supporting it and plan to do so in the future? So I guess I'd, I start, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I have the endorsement from the Marin County Farm Bureau. And we've worked very closely with our agricultural community and helping them with incentive grants to help with um, the predation issue when their uh, animals get eaten by the wild critters out there. We're working with them on the drought issues um, that they're dealing with because while we don't have mandatory um, rationing, they are still having some problems with forage in some of their rangeland areas. Um, our agricultural community is also very concerned that if they have to get forage from outside, especially our organic uh, farms, that it might ruin their organic certification. Um, we're also working with the local coastal plan. Some of the things that are very important to our agriculturalists with, is intergenerational um, com the intergenerational part of the small family farms. So as like Mr. Giacomini is getting ready to retire, do we kick him out of his farmhouse so that one of his daughters can be there on the farm? Or do we allow an opportunity for them to create a secondary unit so that the family can continue to maintain the heritage? Because if our small family farmers um, don't make it, then we're looking at um, 60 acre plots all over West Marin where you can have one ranchette and the character of Marin County will change. So it's an environmental issue. I think the work I'm doing with them right now on the Marin Carbon Project um, has been very exciting. And they look at that as an opportunity because not only are we sequestering carbon and we're retaining more water in the land, but the actual grasses that are growing are really healthy grasses so that Strauss's organic dairy is even better for you 
if you purchase his products. And so um, I'm very proud of the work I've done, and I think that's why the Marin Farm Bureau has endorsed me for this race. Thank you. Jesse, yeah. could you uh, repeat the question? Yeah, uh, Marin County is very proud of our local and organic farming and agriculture. Uh, what are you currently doing and what do you plan to do to support local and uh, organic farming in Marin County? It, it really is one of our uh, best unique qualities. Um, I'm certainly supporting uh, the creation of a permanent farmer's market at the Civic Center. Um, I think the, the farmer's market we've uh, established in Marin is world class. Um, uh, that's a ballot initiative uh, on this same ballot, Measure B. Um, there still are a lot of details that if we pass the measure, essentially what it allows um, uh, the proposal to do is go forward. And then all the planning uh, will, will go around that, including uh, public input. So I'm very much looking forward to that. Um, I'm a huge supporter of our local uh, farms, um, local organics and food. Um, yet again, we've managed to, I think, uh, lead the way. Now other communities around the nation are following our lead. So I'll do everything I can to continue to support those industries. And uh, while this uh, district that uh, uh, I seek to represent um, is not uh, part of the farming community per se, uh, we obviously have a huge stake in it in supporting it. I think really what makes Marin unique is, is our local farms, um, the local ethos uh, that has allowed us to take the lead on uh, local farming. Uh, and I want to make sure that uh, continues to be strong going forward. Great. Thank you. At this time, each candidate will ask their opponent one question. <laughs> their opponent will have one minute to answer. We will start with uh -oh. Damon Connolly. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Uh, okay. Um, Supervisor Adams, do you believe you have adequately been listening to the community and been uh, responsive to the community? And is there any room for improvement? I believe I have been very responsive to the community. Um, you can't broker a deal between the San Rafael Rock Quarry and a mining operation unless you've listened to the community and the operators. Um, the, on the Marinwood Plaza, um, the community, we spent a lot of time working out the details in a planning process on that vision. Um, the, the, the issue about just having retail only, the reason it failed is because retail only was what was there. And you have Northgate Mall on one end and you have all of the Novato retail on the other. So commercial by itself wasn't working out. We went through the very um, deliberative economic analysis and process as we went through that process. Um, I, I do an email newsletters, I answer my home phone number, I um, have community meetings, many community meetings and house meetings, and we audiovisually webcast all of our public meetings, which was a project that I launched at the county. So being involved with the community and listening is important, and there's always room for improvement on any of these things. Okay, thank you. Now, if you have a question for Damon Connolly. Are you ready, Damon? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, during my tenure on the Board of Supervisors, because we have to make decisions about public pensions, I have declined to take the public pension. So if you're elected, would you decline the public pension? Pension reform has been a key issue for me uh, in my work in the city. And that's why I think because of the efforts I've done, I ha actually have the endorsement of uh, Citizens for Sustainable Pension Plans. Um, I, I will decline the uh, auto allowance uh, as part of my supervisor pay. Um, I question uh, the timing of the raise that the supervisors just uh, uh, granted themselves um, heading into this election year, uh, but I will not decline the uh, pension benefit. Okay, thank you. For your final statement, you have three minutes. 
and to sum up your ideas, including your tweet, which is, uh, why should we vote for you in 140 characters? <laughs> <laughs> so you have three minutes for your summary and then a final tweet at the end. Okay. <laughs> we'll start with Damon. Well, again, thank you, everyone, uh, for coming, and particularly to the students. Uh, this has been a, a great discussion. We covered a lot of ground and, and really appreciate it. And I think what we all recognize is, is Marin is a, a phenomenal place to live. Uh, but what I'm hearing and, and what I believe is we can actually do better. Uh, what I'm hearing from the community is that we're ready for a change. We need a supervisor who listens, who puts the needs of residents first, and who provides effective, uh, responsive leadership at the Civic Center. We also need a supervisor who brings people together rather than dividing the community. And I think my track record as a city council member, as chair of Marine Clean Energy, and as a school board president, also as a mediator professionally, is bringing people together. And I think the, the range of support I've gotten in this campaign reflects that, um, ranging from strong envir environmentalists like Congressman Jared Huffman, all of my colleagues on the city council, and nine out of 10 school board members in our district, as well as neighborhood leaders and residents. Our community is really at a turning point and we're facing critical issues right now, most of which we covered this evening, including issues like how development is going to affect our community and how we need to balance uh, our environmental values with the need for affordable housing and how ultimately we're gonna lead the nation uh, on the key environmental issue of our time, which is clim climate change. I'm running to bring a fresh perspective to county government based on my record of leadership, and that includes uh, the innovative Marin Clean Energy Program, which is now serving as a model for the nation, as well as my sustainability le leadership in San Rafael, which has resulted in San Rafael actually being uh, given the Beacon Award, the first statewide sustainability award uh, for a city in California. For me, it comes down to three questions. What makes Marin unique? Why do people move here? And as we know, when they do move here, why do they never leave? And for me, it really comes down to our local values, our fierce environmental ethos, our belief in stellar public schools, in efficient, effective local services, and ultimately in low impact development. We need to regain sight in those of those values and how we're leading at the Civic Center. My campaign slogan is, let's keep the promise of Marin. What it means is decision-making based on local values, informed by collaborative, communicative, uh, community dialogue, resulting in effective leadership. I respectfully ask for your support so we can achieve those values together. Thank you. Right. So I want to thank you all for being here tonight and for offering us yet another opportunity. What have we done a dozen of these already, Probably. Damon, yeah. <laughs> um, to be in front of the community? Um, I care deeply about my community. My whole career has been about caring for community. I'm a nurse. I delivered babies for a living before I did this. And now I'm delivering the goods for the community. I have experience and leadership that you don't want to throw away. I have connections in Sacramento and Washington that have been really instrumental in helping to bring home resources for us, as well as to help affect some really important policy changes. I serve on the National Association of Counties Health Care Reform Committee, and I serve in a leadership position of the California State Association of Counties. And having relationships with state and federal governments is important. One of the things that we didn't talk to about tonight in our sustainability conversation is that 40% of our county budget is health and human services related. 
and I'm a professor of nursing, and I teach courses on health economics and health policy. I have that lens that helps us to identify how we can use those resources in the best possible way for healthy communities. I was instrumental in bringing our health and wellness campus to San Rafael. We did that with tobacco settlement money. We didn't have to use a lot of our general fund dollars for that. I set up a therapeutic justice system that diverted almost 200 severely mentally ill offenders into treatment instead of jail and reduced the recidivism by 85%. We're one of the few jails in the state of California that has empty jail beds. We also reduced their psych emergency visits. I've also um, launched the nationally recognized Medical Reserve Corps, which, is gonna, which has now almost 400 licensed healthcare professionals that are trained and ready to go in a disaster. So I guess my question would be, in a disaster, do you want the attorney or do you want the nurse? <laughs> The, and, and, and I think those experiences um, have, are, are really important in, in helping the continuity as we go through some really important conversations right now on land use. Land use is always really important, but most of our budget is not related to the land use decisions at the county. And I think I've ha I have a stellar record in demonstrating that, that our special areas are still protected. St. Vincent's and Silvera, after 12 years, still doesn't have San Rafael's dream of 2,100 units on it. Heron Hill is now protected, and it's going to turn into a park that, with a connection into China Camp, and we're working on trying to get Bucks Landing in that mix now so that people can use the Water tr Bay Trail, get out, and start exploring our beautiful Bayland areas. I was very instrumental in helping us get the Baylands Corridor as our fourth corridor. And I think I've demonstrated that I have the leadership and the skills and the community engagement to get some really challenging issues over the finish line. And I ask for your support as I've gotten from the Sierra Club, Senator Mark Leno, and former Congresswoman Lynn Woolsey. Thank you. I'd like to thank both of the candidates. I'd also like to thank the audience and Sustainable San Rafael and turn it back over to Bob. Uh, well, and you just said about half of what I was going to say. The other thing I wanted to observe, <laughs> especially for the, for the kids from uh, your program, in case they didn't realize it, I've lived in a bunch of different places in the country. And one of the things that makes Marin special is a race like this to have two people of this quality and a debate of this quality. Trust me, it ain't like this in a lot of this country.